watching all the brothers and sisters divided on the Sunni gate. He be screaming out to the Umar of this world, saying you're to blame. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to another episode of Contemporary Islamic Issues and Concepts on Huda TV. I'm your host, Arkham Rashid. In this episode, we will discuss the importance of seeking knowledge in Islam. Is it compulsory upon everybody? And what does that mean in our society today? So let's start off by welcoming and introducing our wonderful guest, Sheikh Asim Al Hakim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the show. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakumullah khair. Wa alaikum Sheikh. It's always wonderful having these uh, short conversations with you. Uh, so today's topic, inshallah, is the importance of seeking knowledge in Islam. Many times you hear the khatib or many Muslim scholars, various scholars from different backgrounds, different areas, different countries, they all agree that in Islam, Muslims have to seek knowledge. So why is this aspect important in Islam? Why is it that Allah SWT has emphasized seeking knowledge for us? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdihi wa rasulihi al-ameen. Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. Knowledge is the essence of everything you do. And without going into the definition of knowledge that is praised by the Quran and the Sunnah, without knowledge, you are unable to act and do what you want to do properly. And you can relate to this, this easily by buying something and working on it or using it without referring to the uh, uh, manual, the user's manual. Usually this would lead to, maybe you can do something here or there, but eventually you're going to bust the whole thing because you did not properly gain the knowledge on how to use it. So knowledge is important and no one in his sane mind would tell you that, no, I can't behave and act without knowledge. So a doctor without knowledge is not a doctor. An engineer without knowledge is not an engineer. A Muslim without proper knowledge is not a real practicing Muslim. So knowledge is highly emphasized upon in Islam. And if you recall, what is the first instruction what is the first revelation what is the first word that Allah has revealed to his messenger <laughs> which means recite or read so there is great emphasis in Islam on acquiring knowledge hmm. uh, very interesting and who is this emphasis on is it every single Muslim is it a certain group like the ulama the scholars who is this uh, for see again if we, we go a bit back, what kind of knowledge are we talking about? Mm -hmm. And you, you said that it is mandatory upon every Muslim and Muslima to seek knowledge. As the hadith states, mm -hmm. what knowledge are we talking about? So you have to define which types okay, of knowledge sure. are you talking so let, about. Let's start, with, let's start with religious knowledge and then we'll get into uh, secular education, secular knowledge. Uh, so religious knowledge, who is it? compulsory for? Is it for everybody or just the ulama? Okay. Such mandatory knowledge is divided into types. There is mandatory, obligatory knowledge upon each and every individual. And there is knowledge that is a communal uh, uh, obligation, mm -hmm. as they say. So, what is mandatory upon you and me? Akhi, it's mandatory upon you and me to understand the meaning of La ilaha illallah. So if someone says La ilaha illallah without conviction, what do we call him? A hypocrite. Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned in Surah Al-Munafiqeen. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ O Prophet of Allah, when the hypocrites come to you and say, we testify that you are the messenger of Allah and Allah knows that you are his messenger, 
but Allah testifies that they are liars. Which means that saying it without conviction does not do the job. Therefore, there is an obligation upon every Muslim to know the meaning of La ilaha illallah, the meaning of Muhammad is the messenger of Allah Azza wa Jal. There's an obligation upon every Muslim to know the things that his Islam would not be valid without. So if someone is a Muslim but does not know how to pray, we, we do not tell him, Akhi, take your time, sit back, relax, untie your shoes, feel free. No, this is an obligation. You immediately you have to learn how to pray. New reverts, learn how to pray. But say, uh, we don't know how to say the Fatiha. We can't memorize it. This is an obligation upon you. Work as hard as possible to learn it because this is not something that is, okay, do your best. No, you have to. Someone who has wealth and money and he has to pay zakat. So it's mandatory upon him to learn, learn about zakat. how to give zakat and when and what is the uh, threshold. It is not sufficient for him to say, I know it's obligatory, but I don't know the rulings. No, you, you must learn it. Tomorrow is Ramadan. Mm -hmm. So you are instructed to know how to fast, what breaks your fast, the things you do and the things you must not do. So this is an obligation upon every individual. On the other side, there are certain types of information and sciences of Islam that are not obligatory upon you and I. For example, someone who is stone broke, mm. it's not mandatory for him to go and learn the rulings of zakat yeah. or the rulings on transactions. He never goes to the market. He never does any kind of transactions. So why should he learn? However, there has to be a specific group or set of people who know the science inside out. Okay, so let's actually divide this into two parts and let's speak about religious education and non-religious education or secular education. So, uh, Sheikh, if you could start us off with the religious education aspect. Okay, now, the scholars say that the religious education is also divided into two types. Obligatory type and what is known as fard kifaya or communal uh, obligation. So what is the mandatory and obligatory type? It is defined as the type that no Muslim would practice Islam without knowing it. So at the very basics, when someone says la ilaha illallah, we have to know whether he knows the implication of la ilaha illallah or not. Because without the proper knowledge, his testimony would be in vain. Like the hypocrites who say la ilaha illallah but intend something else. totally oppose, uh, opposing it in the, with their hearts. Imagine someone saying la ilaha illallah and going to the graveyards uh, slaughtering for the uh, deceased and, or their awliya or peers, uh, worshipping them, prostrating to them, asking them for benefits and to protect him from harm. This is shirk, major shirk. So his lack of knowledge of la ilaha illallah led him to this. So it is obligatory upon him to know in this specific area. Likewise, a new revert. He doesn't know how to pray. Akhi, don't take your time and inshallah you'll learn next year, maybe in the year after. It is an obligation upon you to learn it now, how to recite the Fatiha. Now we don't tell you, memorize the whole Quran. That would be a good thing, but mm -hmm. it is not to be attained immediately. What you have to learn immediately is the Fatiha. You have to learn how to say Subhana Rabbi al azim in Rukur, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la in Sujood. These are the type of uh, things that your ibadah, your worship to Allah, would not be accepted without. So it's mandatory upon you. And so is the rest of knowledge pertaining to Sharia, to, to Islam, which is required for your forms of worship to be accepted by Allah. On the other hand, there is 
information that is not required now, but might be required later. May, may not be required for you, but may be required for others. For example, a poor person, he's Muslim, and we know that zakah is a pillar of Islam. For him to gain knowledge about zakah is not important. It's not mandatory because the guy does not have the money, the wealth, or the threshold to pay zakah. So mm. why bother at the moment? But of when course, he gets it, then... Yeah, but if he learns it, then this is an, a plus. But he's, he's not obliged to do it. Likewise, someone who does not trade, who does not buy and sell. So we tell him, it's not mandatory for you to learn. Sciences such as the science of al-fara'id, the inheritance and how to divide the wealth of the deceased. It's not mandatory upon you and me to know what's the percentage this gets, one-sixth or one-third, half a quarter, uh, uh, one-eighth, etc. It's not mandatory for him to learn this. So who is it mandatory upon? It is mandatory upon a portion of the Muslims because it's a fard kifaya. It is a communal, communal obligation. If one of the Muslims learn it, then they're all exempted from punishment. But if none of the Muslims learn it, then they are all punished for failing to fulfill this. Hmm. Okay, so that, that's in terms of the Islamic aspect. Just to recap, uh, basically you said that even this is divided into two portions, uh, aspects of education that are required for every single uh, Muslim to learn and aspects that are communal, meaning at least a group of Muslims uh, from the Muslims should learn uh, these, uh, this sort of education and this sort of knowledge. Now, uh, how about in terms of non-religious education, you know, who has to learn this? Is this all, does this also fall under the obligation in the hadith of the Prophet or is this uh, uh, exempted from this hadith? The vast majority of scholars say that the evidences in the Quran and in the Sunnah praising knowledge refers to Islamic knowledge. So when Allah says, يَرْفَعِ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَالَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ دَرَجَاتِ Allah Azza wa Jal elevates and raises the status of those who believe among you and those whom have been given knowledge. So what is this? So a PhD holder in physics is considered to be part of this ayah? Scholars say no. The knowledge that is praised is the knowledge of Islamic sciences. That gets you closer to Allah Azza wa And we will get to explain or elaborate upon this issue a little bit further down the line. Allah says, إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Verily, only the scholars among Allah's servants fear Him truly. But again, the fear is associated with knowledge. What kind of knowledge? Islamic knowledge. So even if we have a Muslim scholar who does not have the fear in Allah Azza wa Jal, he's not a scholar. He has knowledge. Also, you have the hadiths of the Prophet والسلام, of praising the students of knowledge and those who uh, 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 strive to seek knowledge in how Allah Azza wa Jal elevates their status and the whales in the sea, the angels in the heavens, all seek Allah's forgiveness for that seeker of knowledge. This is all relating to Islamic knowledge. Now when we come to non-Islamic knowledge, we do not say that this is bad or this is worthless. We say that this is good depending on your intention and depending on the benefits you provide for the Muslim Ummah. And why do we say the benefits? Because non-Islamic knowledge, or if you may say the secular knowledge, or maybe a better terminology would be the worldly knowledge. Because when you say secular, it means that it's against Islam mm. in the Western uh, uh, way of thinking. So physics, chemistry, um, biology, geology, these sciences are not secularists in the sense that they oppose Islam. 
they are worldly sciences. The majority of it goes side by side with Islam because Islam does not oppose such mm -hmm. sciences as was the case with the early church going against science. And this is what caused the drift till today between science and religion. Mm -hmm. Their church said everything you say is um, considered to be kufr. And such disbelief is intolerable. And they used to execute scientists mm -hmm. who spoke about the world being round or about gravity or about any mm -hmm. of the things that they, the priests, thought that went against the Bible. the Bible. Now, so basically what I understand is that worldly knowledge, as the, uh, you termed it, uh, is not against Islam and you were going to explain about whether or not it would depend completely on your intention. But before you actually answer that, we're going to go for a short break, inshallah. Uh, so dear viewers, stay tuned. As soon as we come back from this short break, uh, Sheikh Asim will explain to us what he means when he said that worldly knowledge will depend on your intention. So stay tuned. TV commercials. Welcome back to Contemporary Islamic Issues on Huda TV. Now before we went for that short break, we were discussing the importance of seeking knowledge. And the Shaykh had categorized it for us very uh, excellently. Uh, Shaykh, now, uh, we were speaking about the different types of worldly knowledge, as you put it, and we already covered uh, Islamic knowledge, and we said there's two types, just to recap for the viewers. Uh, there's a type that is compulsory for every single Muslim to uh, seek and to learn about, and there's the type that is communal. Uh, some Muslims should learn about it, and it will benefit the whole community. However, if nobody learns about it, then the whole community is responsible for not seeking knowledge in that uh, case. Now, we moved on to worldly education, um, or non-religious education. And you were going to explain to us, depending on a person's intentions, uh, if you can clarify that for us. OK, before we go into this topic, it just crossed my mind that Part of the mandatory and obligatory knowledge is to know what you have to do and what you must not do. And we did not speak about that. Meaning that if someone says, ah, I didn't know that wine is haram to consume, mm. this is not excusable in the sense that this is part of the default of Islam. This is the part of the essence of Islam to learn what is haram and what is not haram. So to know that it is not permissible for you to marry your sister, mm. this is elementary. So no one is excused not to have this type of knowledge. Now when we go to worldly uh, uh, knowledge or worldly sciences, it is also divided into two types. One type which is permissible for you to learn and it may become recommended, and it may be mandatory. And we will speak about that. And there is type of the worldly knowledge that it is prohibited for a Muslim to learn. So if we would like to take examples, mm -hmm. if someone applies for a BA in arts, bachelor degree in arts, what are you doing? So I'm going to the university for five years. MashaAllah, and I'm studying from nine to five every single day. Wow, and I'm having quizzes, exams, and grades, and alhamdulillah, I'm an honor student. MashaAllah, tabarakallah, good for you. Knowledge is good. What are you studying? He says acting, mm -hmm. or uh, um, dancing, or music. He says, Akhi, this is all haram. What are you doing? This, what you learn, he says, this is knowledge. Is Islam against knowledge? I said, no, it's not against knowledge, but this is not halal knowledge. If someone goes to university and he does catering, for example, or a, a, a hotel management, and part of the courses he takes deal with how to make wine, how to test wine, how to know what year wine is, and how to serve it. Definitely such a course is totally prohibited. 
the Prophet used yes. to ask Allah in his dua by saying, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min ilmin la yanfa'. I seek refuge in you from knowledge that is not beneficial. And definitely this is not beneficial. Another person goes into studying astrology. Said Haram, it is prohibited to study astrology. Now, if you're studying astronomy and the positions of the stars and the environment and etc. and the weather, there's no problem in that. This is science, inshallah. But when you deal with astrology and the relation between the position of the stars and your future, mm -hmm. or uh, uh, and, and I'm shocked by those who follow and read the zodiacs and these things and he says yeah i'm a scorpion and yeah it says today i'm gonna have a bad day so i'm not going to work this is kufr this is shirk if you read it just for the fun of it see in arabia we have those who drink the turkish coffee mm -hmm. after finishing it they turn the glass upside down so the remains of the coffee would make tracks and, 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 and marks. So they look into it and say, ah, you just drank this? This is a sign that you're going to get married soon. I said, yeah, but I'm already married. I said, yeah, yeah, but maybe you're going to marry again. And if you uh, uh, are maybe it relates that you're going to get divorced. You're going to get sick. All of us are going to get sick someday. Mm -hmm. you, uh, an old friend would call you. Every single day we have old friends calling me. If you do it for the fun of it, like the one who just reads the zodiacs for the fun of it, Allah would not accept the prayers of 40 days. So even if you pray, you'll not be rewarded. Mm -hmm. And if someone says, okay, if Allah is going to not accept 40 days of prayer, I'm not going to pray at all. Why mm -hmm. should I pray? Yeah. If you don't pray, you become a kafir. So you must pray, though you're not rewarded for it, for 40 days. But if you believe in it, so you read it and you go, and you have an accident. And you say, this is exactly what they told me was going to happen. This is shirk. This nullifies a person's Islam. So this kind of knowledge is totally prohibited. No one in his sound mind would say that this is halal because you're teaching something that goes against the religion of Allah. Now, the permissible type of knowledge is completely different. Mm. Someone who studies medicine, helps to cure illnesses, treats sick people. Someone who studies engineering, helps make cities and towns and buildings and roads and bridges, etc. Or factories and, and, and contribute to the benefit of the ummah. Someone who learns how to fly or to how to administer a government uh, um, entity or a company or whatever all of these sciences are worldly sciences and they're permissible but if you have the intention to help Islam and the Muslims so a doctor who goes and studies medicine and he graduates and he pursue his career Akhi, why are you doing this he said man there's a lot of money in it I love it for the money I can buy me a fancy car, I can get married easily, my social status is excellent. People say he's a doctor. Okay, this is permissible. Are you doing something haram? No. no. But you're not rewarded for it. Mm. But if someone learns it with the intention of helping the Muslims, Akhi, why are you studying medicine? He said, well, I like to cure illnesses and help Muslims. And I feel wonderful when they say Jazakallahu Khairan or may Allah reward you. I feel good when I give da'wah before examining a patient to say Bismillah and MashaAllah and uh, InshaAllah. I use this, these Islamic terminologies. I, I feel good about it. In this case, it becomes highly recommended to learn it and you reward it every single step of the way. It becomes mandatory if there's no one in the Muslim Ummah doing it. So if all the Muslims were to go to uh, uh, Islamic schools and Islamic universities and not having a medical doctor, not having an engineer, not having a pilot, not having 
someone, uh, a policeman, they will be all sinful. So it falls under that uh, communal type of firm. Correct. And this is why the scholars interpret Allah's verse, وَأَعِدُّوا لَهُمْ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ مِنْ قُوَّةٍ Allah is in ordering us, instructing us to prepare whatever is possible for us of force. So under the category of force, this refers to military force, it refers to uh, uh, um, scientific force, uh, economical force, and this is a communal obligation among them, upon the Muslims. Mm. Okay, so uh, what I can extract from, uh, from the beginning of the show till now, what I understand is that, and correct me if I'm wrong at any point, inshallah, is that knowledge can be categorized into three. Uh, just as a general, whether it's worldly knowledge or Islamic, into three. One which is uh, compulsory for every single person, every single Muslim to seek, and this is uh, things that deal with his religion, things that deal with the aspects of his religion that he needs to fulfill. And then the second category would be communal, whether this is things part of, that are part of his religion that don't deal with him directly, uh, such as uh, dividing the inheritance. So somebody in the community has to understand and study this. And also things such as uh, medicine, engineering, this would also fall under communal. And the third type is that knowledge which is haram under Islam to seek, not because of knowledge itself, but because of what it is, what the science is, such as music, or whatever that science may be if it's per, uh, prohibited in Islam. Is that correct? correct. That okay, inshallah. Correct. And um, so just uh, the last question now, inshallah, to give the viewers an idea of how they can start seeking knowledge. So now somebody decides, okay, this is my first time you know, watching on knowledge. I didn't know it was compulsory for me to seek knowledge in, in zakat, and I have money. I didn't know it was compulsory for me to learn the prayers. I thought maybe I could do it step by step. I didn't have to do it right away. Now, how should this person start seeking knowledge? Where should he start and who should he take from? How does he know which scholars to choose? How, how, is, he, how is he going to figure this out? Well, to answer this, we need maybe a yeah, little bit yeah, more extensive answer. But try to put it in a nutshell. Who to learn from? This is the question that we always hear repeatedly being asked by Muslims. Who should we follow? Who should we learn from? Who should we ask? Who should we uh, uh, seek fatwa from? The answer of, uh, uh, to this would be that you have to look and do your level best because Allah would only question you according to your ability, not according to the results. So if you did your level best in, in trying to identify the most suitable uh, uh, and correct scholar available and you followed him then Allah Azza wa Jal would not hold you accountable until you discover otherwise so what is the criteria well first of all he has to be knowledgeable and knowledgeable is not something that you look into with your own knowledge and say wow this guy is knowledgeable because a person in first grade would look to a pupil in the sixth grade as being knowledgeable. See the difference? Though the pupil in sixth grade mm -hmm. is still a kid, but he's way knowledgeable to the one in, in first comparison grade. comparison to the first grade. Yeah. So it is not for you to decide. Mm -hmm. So a real scholar is the one who is acknowledged by no, other okay. scholars to be a scholar. Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah have mercy on his soul, said, I did not give fatwa until 70 scholars of my contemporary time gave me permission to do so. Mm -hmm. So he was known to other scholars. Nowadays, you have so many people coming in the media like us, and people point at them and say, these are scholars. Akhi, how do you know just because they are on TV? Mm -hmm. You get so many deviant people on TV that are following bid'ah, that they have corrupt aqidah, but just because they appear on TV does not make them scholars. scholars. And there are other aspects that we can add to this, but I don't know if the time... Unfortunately, we're out of time for this episode, inshallah. Um, 
if we want, we can come back and do another episode dealing with uh, the qualities that you should look for uh, in a scholar, in a preacher, in somebody that you want to follow, inshallah. But, uh, Shaykh, I really want to end this episode off by thanking you for that one understanding of seeking knowledge in Islam very categorized very you know simple for the people to understand thank you very much Sheikh <laughs> dear viewers I hope you benefited from today's program and until next time may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh <laughs>